Hey folks, Michael Mann with Michael Mann Security Services. Welcome to Left Wing Terrorism, History and Modern Violence. Quickly, as people are jumping on to join us, it's right at the hour. Uh, so contact us. You can go to our webpage, michaelmannsecurityservices.com. Send us a message. You can call us, 615-606-1006. You can get us at Scott M, S-C-O-T-T-M, at michaelmannsecurityservices.com. You can get us at contact, C-O-N-T-A-C-T, at michaelmannsecurityservices.com. Or you can always go to Instagram and Facebook, send us a message. Facebook, we're the fastest answering. If I see it on, a, on my phone or Scott sees it, we'll get right back to you immediately. All right, things coming up just real quick. All right, it's, uh, Sunday, September 13th, 1 to 5, Brentwood, Tennessee, Armed Vehicle Defense. We had our webinar last night on uh, introduction to vehicle defense. So this is a continuation of the webinar. This is actually how to fight in and out of the car. We talk about ballistics, presentation from the car, moving in and out of the car, uh, how to do that safely, and how to survive a fight if you have to do that in and around your vehicle. All equipment will, uh, or will be uh, furnished. Enhanced concealed carry, Friday, September the 11th from 5 to 9 in Brentwood. Uh, Non-firing class. This gets into things like use of force options, equipment selection, de-escalation te de techniques, uh, I'm sorry, presentation for concealment, movement while inside your home environments in the house, which you do if something bad happens, uh, and then, of course, self-defense in the home, target engagement procedures, uh, and so on, and some basic physical security design for your home. So if you already got your carry permit, either from us or somebody else, this gets into those enhanced topics. And there will be some force-on-force -force exercises in that training for you. Uh, Sunday, this Sunday, August 16th, 1 to 4.30 p.m., this is a virtual instructor-led training event, Church Protection Specialist Module 1. Uh, we've uh, put one church successfully through all three modules. We're working with three other churches to put them uh, through the entire thing. They just finished Module 2. So they'll be moving to Module 3, so we start over, and that starts August 16th. We still have four uh, um, uh, available slots open for Sunday's class. So go to our website to sign up. And then the Israeli security concept, uh, that is uh, Module 1 Threat Identification, Sunday, August 23rd, same thing, that's a virtual instructor ladder or a Zoom platform, 1 to 4.30, uh, and I think we have three slots in that class left. you still got some time. That's the 23rd toward the end of the month. All right, so expectations for today. I promise we always go uh, go uh, uh, longer than what we say, but this will be a short one, 30 minutes or less. So uh, left-wing terrorism, history, and modern violence while we're talking about this. So we want to provide you with some context of current events. So uh, if you're looking at what's going on today with uh, civil disobedience and why things are happening to the church and what it looks like with law enforcement and why are these things happening in the United States of America, we want to show you that historically this, this idea, these objectives are nothing new, and we're going to tell you where they're coming from. Uh, so we'll get into the history, and then I've got some case studies uh, from some older left-wing terrorist organizations or groups to show you to kind of circle about, uh, back to the points that we're going to talk about, and then we're just going to give you that quick strategy. Most of you guys already know that, okay? All right, so just a quick review terrorism. As you guys know, we've talked about this before, hard to define, but you've heard this in some of our other webinars, use of violence, fear, and intimidation to achieve political, social, or religious objectives. We classify, or another organization classifies to, uh, terrorist uh, organizations for us, religio-political, uh, nationalist, state-sponsored or state-supported, uh, single issue, and then, of course, the ideological terrorists. That's what we're going to talk about today, very specifically the extreme left model of ideological terrorism. Okay, so again, the idea is to give you guys some context of some stuff that's happening today, where they came from, nothing new under the sun. All right, so uh, if you're kind of wondering, you know, again, why is this happening? Where is it coming from? Here's where it comes, uh, comes from. So here's the idea behind uh, left-wing ideology or these left-wing terrorist organizations. It's all influenced by Karl, uh, Karl Marx's teaching. Or if you've ever heard of the Communist Manifesto or you've ever read part of that, that's Karl Marx. Um, here's the idea uh, behind this theory, uh, that people will become unhappy with the political culture of their country uh, because it becomes fascist or it's too right-wing, and they will, uh, they'll call for this vast majority of society to violently rise up and stop it. So the idea behind this left-wing ideology, we talk about Marxist teaching, very specifically that capitalist society like the United States of America is evil, it's bad. And when we talk about the majority, or he talks about the majority of society will rise, rise up and stop it, the majority is the worker. That's the working class. And there's an idea behind that, and we'll get into it. The minority here 
are going to be the people, the owners of production, or the middle and upper class. So we're going to get into in just a second this idea of uh, where he got this, the majority should rise up and stop this because uh, capitalism is evil. And, you know, why this minority, why the owners of production, why the middle class and upper class uh, should be eliminated, why this is a bad idea. Okay. All right. So some uh, history or pro just uh, kind of historical perspective on March or on uh, Marx. So uh, Marx grew up or when he was born, he was a Jew, uh, which uh, some very interesting history. And without getting into theology and about, uh, you know, maybe just just what the Jews have suffered, what they've had to go through and what that turns into. Uh, Marx's father was a was an attorney. Uh, and from my understanding, they were practicing Jews, and they lived in Germany. Uh, and at the time, uh, to kind of escape anti-Semitism, um, the Marx family actually converted to Lutheranism. And they did that so his father could still continue to practice law, to make a living. And so uh, Marx uh, grows up first. Uh, he's born into this Jewish family. Uh, they they are uh, forced to convert to escape this anti-Semitism, uh, so his father can uh, continue to make a good living, practice in law, and I'm sure that had a big influence on him. And so, uh, what happens is he he goes to college, uh, goes away to college, uh, and then at some point becomes a student of law. And in between all this time, he um, uh, he is influenced uh, by some, uh, very specifically by one lecturer, an ideologist who's an atheist and has very uh, radical political views. And about the same time as this is happening, now he goes to college, uh, goes to one college, he ends up racking up a bunch of debt, gets into a bunch of trouble, you know, gets a hold of his dad, says, hey, I need some help. His dad agrees to help him, but his dad sends him away to another college. Says, hey, listen, I'm going to help you, but you're going to have to get away from where you are to go somewhere else. And then uh, at that point, he decides that he wants to study philosophy. Um, about the mid-19th century, we start talking about these ideas and where this comes from. We see the Industrial Revolution both here and we see it in Europe. And so what happens in Europe is the Industrial Revolution, so things like the steam engine or the steam motor are created or they're, they're invented. And so what that does is that creates a shift in the workforce. And so before this time, mid-19th uh, 19th century in Europe, what happens, you've got these small towns or shires in these areas uh, throughout Europe where the people worked in these towns. Uh, they worked in the small businesses. They had businesses. They farmed. Uh, now, I don't know what kind of a living people made in, in, in that era, what that looked like, but as this Industrial Revolution kicked off, what it did is it, uh, it, it made people start to look toward, toward the larger cities like London, where they were building these factories, uh, and because there was this demand for all this technology or what, what was considered technology at the time or these inventions. And so people started to move to these large cities, and as they started to move to the large cities and move away from the small cities, uh, working conditions and living conditions were not always desirable. And so as more people crowded in these places, and because this was very new to the entire world, uh, working conditions could be bad. And so people moved into these areas. They lived in very small places. They were crowded. The conditions were bad. There was no OSHA. Uh, there were no uh, be uh, benefits at the time for employees. And so Part of this ideology that Marx, by, uh, that Marx buys into from uh, this atheist and these ideologues that he started connecting himself with, and then uh, at, at this point he's living in London, he starts to see these conditions, and also to put on top of that, uh, as he gets out of school, as he uh, it, it ended up, you know, uh, becomes a philosophy major, he gets into journalism, very specifically left journalism. And so then he starts to see what happens to people, and then he puts all these ideas together, and what he decides is uh, that people now are, that they, they're separating these classes. And so you've got this working class, and then you've got, of course, you've got uh, this upper class that actually own these factories and that uh, manage and that, uh, that lead these workers. And the idea, because these things are bad, and because capitalism at some point falls, what should happen or capitalism actually should turn into or it does turn into a pol uh, violent political revolution, and that equals both a classless uh, and a moneyless uh, society that people should rebel against these factory owners, these people that are running this. And there's all these violent ideas behind it. And so this is the history and the mindset of where this left-wing ideology or left-wing terrorism comes from, the idea that there should be no class, everybody is the same, uh, that there is no money, 
uh, that there are no classes. And of course, when we start to look at this idea, a lot of this comes from the ideas uh, he learned early in college as he started to uh, uh, started to listen to uh, atheists uh, and, and started to connect with those people. Uh, so when we start talking about left-wing terrorism, so just a quick history behind where this comes from, and you, especially if, as a believer, as you look at this to think about what is good and bad and, and, and why they think this way, let's start getting into terrorism and the characteristics of left-wing terrorism based on this idea. So um, left-wing terrorism has both political and social objectives. So there's no religious objective in this because actually religion in this is bad. If we think about Marxism, we think about communism, religion is a bad thing because religion is something that can push the people, it can motivate the people, so it, so it is something that obviously is not allowed. Um, and so there are political and social objectives in left-wing terrorism. Two, the idea, so as I start to read through these characteristics, I want you folks to start thinking about what's happening today, okay? And so the focus is to purposely create fear and panic. Because as human beings, after the fall, because, you know, after we leave the presence of God, we are fallen people, what happens now, because Satan is always whispering in our ear, we become fearful. Things change, things happen, and so we live in this fearful environment. And so as we create, as, as uh, panic and fear are created, people, uh, very specifically people with this mindset, completely understand that uh, due to panic and fear, they can change people's minds. They can get people to do things that they normally would not do, and that can be easy. And so with that, uh, these left-wing terrorist organizations, they use well-planned tactics and objectives. So some of the things that you're seeing today, it, it's not like uh, that just happened overnight. When we see civil disobedience, when we see the planning or we see the, the uh, uh, see uh, the uh, I guess the overall um, – uh, what, what happens, this, this objectives, the things that we see, those were planned because these groups uh, use very uh, well-planned tactics and they have ver ver uh, very well-planned objectives that might have been planned two years ago. So this is not something that's thought of overnight. Um, very specifically, left-wing terrorism requires media attention and an audience, and here's the reason why they need that. Number one, is because, especially today, with the media attention, it could cause the people, especially the people, the victims here, uh, to not react or to worry about some sort of an overreaction. And so also with the media attention, that also creates financial and ideological support for the groups. And one of the biggest characteristics of left-wing terrorism is it tries to get a government or a large group to overreact and that overreaction can also create financial and ideological support. So there, when we start to think about the characteristics of the idea, the history behind this, uh, why, why we believe it's wrong, and number two, the characteristics of these groups, again, think about the context of what you see today, what you see in the news. This is where this comes from. All right. So get into some uh, case studies. Uh, so uh, specifically two left-wing groups from years ago. So in the United States... Late 60s, early 70s into the probably about the early to mid 80s, there there was a um, there was a push and there was a lot of left wing terrorism activity that started to die off in the mid 80s. Uh, we didn't see a lot of it for a long time, and of course now we start to see it. Uh, we start to kind of see it rear its ugly head. And so I want to show you or, or kind of go through some case studies of some left wing terrorist organizations, and these are this is violent. But when we start to talk about these ideas and where, they, where these come from, I'll start to plug in some things that are happening today so you can see these and understand them. So number one, or the first group, is the Red Army Faction, or the RAF. So if you haven't heard of the RAF before, it's a violent left-wing terrorist organization that believed the United States to be an imperialist power and that the West German government, so this is where this, uh, where this organization was born, um, was a holdover of the Nazi era of Germany, so they're bad. So they don't like the, they didn't like the United States, and obviously they hated West Germany. To finance their operations, they conducted bank robberies, and then they got into assassinations, attempted assassinations, bombing, uh, arsons, and kidnappings. 
Now, the goal, like we talked about, think about we talk about the characteristics of left-wing terrorist organizations. They want a government to overreact. And so here, their goal was to try to get the German government to react, which may spark a broader revolutionary movement. Where does that come back from? That comes back from the idea of Karl Marx. And so the idea here was to try to get the German government to overreact. And again, that might cause some sort of revolutionary uh, movement uh, by the people there in West Germany. Now, what happens later... Uh, as uh, some of this influence of the RAF starts to wane, what happens is they start to uh, align with militant Palestinian groups. Uh, and so uh, if you watch television or if you read like I do, if you guys uh, ever read uh, The Raid on Entebbe or like Operation Thunderbolt or if you saw the movie of the Israeli rescue of the citizens in, uh, of the Israelis uh, in, um, in, uh, in, in Tibi there in uh, Uganda, uh, the RAF had actually teamed up with a Palestinian organization to uh, hijack that airline. And so uh, also, uh, outside of this raid on Entebbe, or uh, again, going back to the movie, if you guys have seen this, uh, they also, uh, there's a Japanese Red Army faction, so a spinoff of the RAF in West Germany. And so uh, these Palestinians convinced the RAF uh, to help uh, get the Japanese Red Army faction uh, to be recruited to go into Lot Airport, which is today uh, Tel Aviv Airport, then Tel Aviv in Israel, and to go in to that airport, to get into it, get on a plane, uh, sm uh, smuggle weapons in which they did and conduct an attack at Lot Airport. If you've taken our Israeli security concept, uh, both level one and level two, very specifically level one, threat identification, we talk about the Lot, Lot Airport attack for two reasons. Number one, because it's got to do with left wing terrorism. Number two, because this was uh, it, before this attack, uh, and I'll give you the, kind of the history on it. You probably heard it from something we've talked about before. Before this the attack, the Israelis were really profiling. And so what they were doing when they were looking for terrorists, because of the time in the 70s, this is in 1972, the Israelis were suffering from uh, Palestinians hijacking their airplanes. And so they were actually looking for Arabs all the time. And so they actually were profiling Arabs. Here, what the Palestinians did is they went to the RAF. The RAF goes to the uh, ja uh, Japanese Red Army faction. They recruit uh, Japanese terrorists. And so when they actually got on the plane and landed at the airport, they were disguised as musicians. They had weapons inside these uh, cases. And so the Israelis did not uh, look at these Japanese Red Army faction. Of course, they didn't know that they were RAF, but they didn't look at those passengers as a threat because of profiling. After this successful attack, a number of people were killed. I think 80-plus were wounded in the attack. Then the Israelis went to, uh, which we teach in the Israeli security concept, this behavioral-based threat detection technique. And so this comes back to, uh, again, this attack at Lot Airport. So the RAF teams up with uh, a number of Palestinian groups. And, of course, again, we talk about the uh, Air France hijacking, which turned into the rescue uh, from the Israeli Special Forces there in Uganda. And then, of course, the Lot Airport massacre that we just went over. Very quickly, here is a video that just talks about the history and talks about the violence that West Germany had to face as they dealt with the RAF. Red Army Faction becomes a synonym for terrorism in West Germany. They use violence to make their voices heard. Andreas Bader and other terrorists believe it is their right to fight the state, which they call fascist, using any means available. They are wanted right across West Germany. The terror escalates. Of course you can shoot, says the terrorist Ulrike Meinhof. Peter Jürgen Boek was once a member of the RAF. I think that around 1968, it was just endemic to ask the question if an armed battle is an option and a means of bringing about change. It was discussed on a broad front. The fact that a relatively small group made this discussion their own and put it into practice was a real shock for many who were taking part in the theoretical discussion. The small terrorist group keeps the Republic on its toes. In June 1972, the core of the RAF is finally arrested. Alongside Ulrike Meinhof and Gudrun Enslin, Holger Mainz, Jan Karl Raspe and Andreas Bader. The Stuttgart Stammheim prison. Now it isn't just political change, but also the release of the political prisoners that is the aim of the continued terror. 
1977, the murderous activities of the RAF reached their bloody climax. It is violence against people who apparently embody the hated system. The Republic is in a state of emergency. With the kidnapping of the president of the Employers Association, Hans Martin Schleyer, and the hijacking of a Lufthansa passenger jet, they seek to force the release of RAF prisoners. But the government stands firm. Schleyer is murdered. If you take the contradictions of the group in the handling of their own affairs as a benchmark, we should have noticed that there was hardly anyone in the group who would have seriously been in favor of the death penalty. Nevertheless, we killed people and thought of ourselves as judge and executioner in the same breath. There was also hardly anyone in the group who would have been in favor of pulling innocent people into disputes. The calculation was, it can't be avoided. That's not how we thought, but that's how we acted. The German Chancellor of the time has his own opinions. I feel contempt for all those who imagine that they can use force, manslaughter and even murder to implement their ideologies, their ideals. After 1992, the first ex-terrorists are released. Six years later, the RAF declares their dissolution by fax. Just a quick video so you guys get the history of the RAF. And so it mentioned this attack in, uh, in this uh, video that you guys just watched. So we're going to talk about the kidnapping and then uh, uh, eventually the assassination after 44 days of being in, uh, uh, being kidnapped and being in custody by the RAF of Hans, of Hans Schleyer in September 5th, 1977. So uh, this goes back to we st uh, start to talk about objectives, characteristics, violence. We start talking about bombings, assassinations, attempted assassinations, and kidnapping. This is a famous one. So if you, uh, if you guys are in, uh, anybody watching that's a professional protector, you guys have been to Joe's, Joe Arturo's VDI. If you've been to the, uh, the surveillance detection course, you know he talks about this uh, in detail. In fact, he does a really good job of, of breaking this down and uh, using some of these objectives to teach um, surveillance detection as you go through that course. Excellent course. You get a chance to go. Uh, Joe's an excellent teacher and really gets into uh, these case studies to teach, uh, to actually teach you surveillance detection. EPI also teaches us the Executive Protection Institute, and even Oatman's course will get into this, uh, get into this uh, case study. So in 1977, September 5th, uh, Schleyer is uh, uh, the president of the German Employers Association. And so at this point, there's been a risk assessment done on Schleyer, and the German government says, hey, look, you need full-time protection like enhanced protection. So he has a full protective detail. He has a security driver, and he has three armed agents that uh, follow in a police escort vehicle. So uh, he has a Mercedes, which does not have uh, ballistic protection. It is up front. He has a security driver. And then these three armed agents are in the, are in the back, so they follow him. The uh, uh, the configuration of the agents that follow him in that in that well, it's really a trail car they call it an escort car. There is a driver, there is an armed agent in the front seat, an armed agent in the back seat. Uh, they had pistols and they also had uh, subguns. Uh, the subguns though were kind of mounted down uh, on the doors, and so it was uh, during the attack it was hard for them to get to those guns. And so uh, what ends up happening is the IRF conducts detailed pre-attack surveillance. So when we go back again to the characteristics of left-wing terrorists, they have very well-planned out objectives and very well-planned out tactics. This is where this comes into, okay? And so they actually uh, rent an apartment not too far from the attack location to conduct uh, like non-stop pre-attack surveillance so they can see the attack route. They watch as uh, Schleyer and his protective detail take this route throughout the week. Uh, they actually do rehearsals at the attack site. Uh, it was after the attack as the police start to conduct the investigation after Schleyer's kid, uh, kidnapped, people start to come out and they start to talk about, we, look, we saw these, these group of people here doing the suspicious things. We called the police. We reported it. Um, and, you know, uh, but, you know, we saw this. We saw this thing. It was very weird, especially this woman this, with this baby carriage. And so uh, what happens? They plan this out. And on September the 5th, what they do? They set up an ambush. And so as Slyer's Mercedes makes a right turn on the street, uh, his protective detail car is behind him, uh, probably too close right behind him, right up on his bumper. Um, what happens is a yellow Mercedes pulls out. So there's six terrorists in this attack. 
they pull out the Mercedes uh, and they actually hit Slyer's car in the front, front right side. And then there is a woman. She's also part of the attack. She has a baby carriage and she runs the baby carriage to the front of towards Slyer's vehicle. And they do that, or she does that specifically, so the security driver doesn't try to go around the yellow Mercedes. It's tried to block them in. And at that point, they conduct a vehicle assault. They kill the driver, and then they very quickly uh, conduct a vehicle assault, and they kill the three protective agents in the back. During the attack and during the investigation, they found out that the, uh, a couple of the agents could not get their uh, vehicle-mounted uh, subguns out of uh, the vehicle or out of the mounts. And so the three protective agents are killed. They uh, kidnap Slyer. They, uh, they demand these things that we, they talked about in this last video. And when they do not happen, 44 days later, they end up assassinating him and then leaving his, leaving his body to be found uh, in Germany. So what you're about to see is uh, uh, the Germans made a movie about it, and this is a very good depiction of what happened. And so you guys can kind of see the attack and see how well planned out it was and the violence that just occurs with these left-wing groups. So again, this is a movie, but it's a very, it's a very good depiction of the actual attack itself. So there's Slyer's Mercedes, protective detail behind him. The yellow Mercedes, there's the woman with the baby carriage. The yellow Mercedes pulls out and blocks his vehicle. She runs the baby carriage up towards the vehicle. In the movie, it doesn't show up, but she actually rammed it up against the front of the car so he, the driver would like to go around, and then the attack starts. Three protective agents are trying to get out. And then, of course, it's an all-out vehicle assault in the LJ as they start to Okay, next case study very quickly. Uh, we're going to talk about the Weather Underground or the Weatherman. So uh, this was designed from a radical left-wing Students for a Democratic Society organization in 1969. Again, think about the char characteristics of the left-wing tourist organization and some of the stuff that you're seeing today. Uh, the beliefs that the war in Vietnam uh, was wrong and that black Americans were being oppressed so that action needed to be taken against the United States government, very specifically violent action. Now, the idea was to overthrow the government through violent revolution. And so what you saw was you saw violent protests in the street, uh, very specifically a large protest in Chicago. Uh, there were clashes with police, again, things you see today. And then there were very specifically bombing of 24 targets to include the Pentagon and uh, an NYPD police station. And there were also violence against the police. And so we think about, again, what are these ideas? We start talking about the characteristics of left-wing terrorism, violent overthrow of governments, going back to this Marxist ideology. You see that the, none of this is uh, new, none of this. All this stuff, uh, again, was happening here in the U.S. in the 60s, all the way up into the early, uh, early to mid-1980s. Uh, very quick video on uh, weather underground or on uh, weather underground here in just a second. The FBI said the Weather Underground Organization, which took credit for the bombing, is the same radical group which was responsible for the bombing of the U.S. Capitol in 1971 and the Pentagon in 1972. Hello, this is the first communication from the Weatherman Underground. I'm going to read a declaration of a state of war. Kids know the lines are drawn. Revolution is touching all of our lives. This system is going to be overthrown. It's going to mean a fight. And it's going to mean a lot of white people risking a lot of things. Don't ever say we're going into a revolution. We're in a revolution. Now the question is, who's going to win it? Freaks are revolutionaries, and revolutionaries are freaks. Within the next 14 days, we will attack a symbol or institution of American injustice. Anyone who does have any information on where these people are located should immediately contact the FBI. There's no way to be committed to nonviolence in the middle of the most
most violent society that history's ever created. I'm not committed to nonviolence in any way. When you feel that you have right on your side, you can do some horrific things. All right, so just quick history there on the Weather Underground. Again, as you kind of start to on the video, as you kind of uh, start to saw, uh, watch and you listen to some of the language and, and some of the things that were being said on that video, again, kind of start thinking about some of the things that are happening today, the objectives, and why they are what they are and where they're coming from. Again, nothing new. So let's talk about strategy real quick. Number one, go, or going back to the characteristics, again, this adversary uses well-planned tactics. So as a security professional, again, when we start to talk about, think about the slayer attack or the assassination, or first it was a kidnapping that talked to, uh, turned into assassination. So number one, if you're a protector, church protector, you're in executive protection, you're protecting the building, know your protected environment. What is expected in your environment? Get training on understanding what that survey looks like, and how to conduct that actual assessment. We do that. We do that once or twice a month. That's exactly what the Israeli security concept is. It teaches that, and that comes, that concept comes out of an attack that occurred from a left-wing ideological group. So get that training and understand what is normal in your environment and what is abnormal. Number two, understand the requirements for a successful attack. The requirements for a successful attack are, number one, the adversary must gather information about your target or your protected environment. Number two, the adversary must have the element of surprise to be successful. Number three, the adversary must be in control, which means they're going to use explosives, they're going to use some kind of weapons, they're going to use something to cause death or serious bodily injury. And number four, they must be mobile, they must be able to move around. We've talked about this before we talk about behavioral detection. And again, this is just something you use. I think we talked about this last week. Uh, some things to look for, we talk about that acronym APB and not the police APB, but number one, we start to look at people that are hypervigilant or aware of their surroundings. Remember, only three people are always aware of their, uh, aware of their surroundings. Number one, the protector, the professional security guy or, 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 or woman that is on the job that is always watching and protecting. Number two, the police officer. The police officer is all, always hypervigilant or aware of their surroundings. And number three, the predator. If it's not a police officer, not a protect or a professional protector at your location, and you see that hypervigilance, that's something to look at, right? So again, we talk about those requirements as they gather information and that element of surprise. If we have this awareness or we see that hypervigilance, this can interrupt that process. Number two, positioning. Positioning would be for an attack. Are they sitting or are they are located somewhere where normally sub not, someone would not be, especially if it's a critical area, or if they're conducting surveillance, are they in a position or location where they could conduct surveillance and gather that information that is a requirement for that successful attack? And number three, the most important, which is behavioral or behavioral uh, uh, behavior itself or belongings or something that they're wearing or something they have with them. Is their behavior normal for that environment? So when we look at things like requirements requirements for a successful attack, just three uh, easy elements you guys can use, and again, get training for it, and we do that. It's like pennies on the dollar. We're doing it August the 23rd, the Israeli security concept. It teaches this, and this concept came out of a left-wing terrorist attack. Surveillance detection and the use of your uh, suspicious activity reports. Have a surveillance detection program. Learn what surveillance looks like. Set up those policies and procedures to be able to detect it. Use your suspicious activity reports not only to, to actually um, document what you see, but make sure that's circulated and that report is validated. Uh, develop relationships with your local law enforcement officers and your fusion centers. We don't have to depend on the police to train us, but it's a good idea to have a relationship with your police departments, your fire departments, your first responders. So if something does happen, they will get there quickly. Not that they will not, but it is a good idea to build a relationship with them, let them see your protected environment and understand exactly what it is you're doing or what you will do if an attack occurs. Fusion centers are some information that they can give out. There's some stuff they can't give out, but there's a lot of free open source information that you can use. And that gets into, again, we talked about this before, use of your open source intelligence or open source intelligence for you. We talked about that several seminar or several webinars ago where you can actually go online and you can Conduct, can conduct um, uh, intelligence operations using open source information. 
when uh, uh, violent protests or when protests are going to happen, what that looks like, who the targets are going to be, and you can start to track that activity on Facebook. You can track it, track it in Eventbrite and other locations that are open source to you where you can see them. All right, that was a quick one, folks. We're at 434, 1634, so we were talking uh, for about uh, uh, 34 minutes. So we appreciate it. Uh, no questions. Um, uh, just uh, especially my church protectors out there, uh, you know, there's a lot of chatter on the church protection uh, web pages about what are we going to do if this happens at our church. Uh, some things for us to remember. Uh, number one, none of this is new. Uh, we, we started going through this process after the fall, and you know that it is human nature. Number two, Psalms tells us that obviously evil will destroy the wicked. Evil will destroy the wicked. Maybe not on our timeline. Uh, but it will happen. And so some things, if you are protecting a house of worship, uh, and you know, I don't, it doesn't matter what house of worship it is, I, it, you know, if it's a synagogue, it's a church, it's a mosque, uh, understand that evil will destroy the wicked at some point. Probably not on our timeline, but it will happen. And again, remember, there's nothing new about any of this, all right? So just be aware, be vigilant, talk to each other, be alert, uh, and just pay attention. All right, folks, uh, thanks again for joining us. This was a quick one. We want to make, make it quick. You want to join us next week. We're going to get into the response to this. We're going to use a case study that just happened where a church did come under attack, uh, and we're going to talk about when you actually do have to respond. So whether you, you didn't have a surveillance detection program uh, or you had one and you didn't see it, and this comes to your church and what's going to happen. So we're going to go back to the church environment next week. Okay, we do have a question. How do you contact a fusion center? Yep, so the question is, how do you contact a fusion center? So whatever state you're in, go into, so here at Tennessee, just go to, you know, if you're in Tennessee or Ohio or whatever, type in your state in fusion center contact. Very quickly, a basic, uh, probably a 1-800 number will come up. Uh, that number, uh, most of the time, is, is monitored 24-7. Uh, you can call, tell them who you are. Tell them what kind of information you're looking for, and two things will happen. If it's during uh, normal business hours, they may contact with you uh, somebody with you right away. If not, uh, they may actually forward you to somebody else, and you can leave a voice message, and somebody will get back with you in a couple days. If you didn't get anything uh, from that person, what you can do is call your local Department of Homeland Security. There are Protective Security Advisors, or PSAs. Uh, they are also, if you look those folks up, or look the fo uh, folks up, Department of Homeland Security PSA in your city or your state, there'll be a contact or at least an email address where you can send information, and they will help you get in contact with your fusion center. One more question. And Daryl Glasscock is also asking, can you give an example or a template of an SAR? Uh, so we can give, you know, we can send you an example of an SAR. We have one that we use that somebody gave me a long time ago. If you will email us at Scott M, S-C-O-T-T-M, at michaelmansecurityservices.com, Scott will send you that SAR, okay? Or if you want to send us a message on Facebook through the Safe of Man Facebook page, again, Scott will send that to you because that's all Scott does. He just monitors the Facebook page and his email. All right, that's all the questions, folks. Thanks. Thanks for the questions. Uh, right at uh, 1638, so we want to make it a quick one. Uh, we hope you got something out of this. Hey, you don't want to miss it next week. We're going to put this out on Eventbrite on the page here pretty soon. You're going to see next, so you're not able to prevent this thing or you didn't see it, what happens. You're going to see what response looks like next week, and we're going to walk you through that case study of a church that was overrun at a protest. Okay? All right, folks, thanks again. Be careful, be vigilant, and remember, it's about prevention, not response.